<laughs> I'm kidding, I never do a quick video. Uh, somebody called me on that one the other day when I did my flash video. It ended up an hour long. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to go that long, but yeah, you got me. Uh, got notes again. Yeah, uh, I'm getting more professional. I got a piece of paper. Last one was just a napkin I wrote on. This one was an actual piece of paper. Pulled it up different ways. But anyway, World War Three update. Uh, uh, where do I ch uh, chime in on this one? Um, there's going to be a lot about China, so I guess I'll just kind of go through it like this. Uh, yes, so China. Now, the world is kind of, we know the world's a crazy place. It's always been a crazy place. And now, but now we're a crazy place in the nuclear age. Uh, we know Russia only has like two other uh, official bases outside of Russia. But China is now starting to expand. Uh, they're going to be putting a base in Africa, a military base in Africa, Central Africa. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's significant. I forget exactly which country they're putting it in. But I can see why they're doing it. I mean, the Chinese have been working, you know, with African countries like in Nigeria and places like that. Uh, and everywhere they go to build partnerships and, and for resources and stuff like that, then, they, you know, terrorism follows. So Boko Haram, again, like ISIS, Boko Haram, I don't talk about them very much, but they are pretty much, it looks like they're backed by the CIA as well. Almost all these jihadi groups are. And that's because it's against China. Same with South America. Uh, with the uh, We have the Panama Canal, which the Chinese kind of own it, but really it is Rothschild owned. Uh, so they're going to be building in Nicaragua, they're going to be building their own canal. I that don't know when it will be done, but that will bypass the Rothschild Canal. Uh, so in other words, competition. So that, I think, when that's done, then you're going to see some real uh, hardship against the uh, petrodollar. So the Chinese building a base outside of China is is out of that that is out of the normal. That is not something that they normally do. Um, so the last thing we need is China with expanding, uh, you know, to, to to get into that expansionism kind of mentality, uh, because that that guarantees a war for sure. Uh, so that, that that's something uh, that they're doing. And on top of that, they've got this new missile that they're it's a cruise missile, I guess. Uh, it's supposed to have basically autonomous uh, decision making. It's a fire and forget missile. Basically, they could fire it off. They could go to another target. That missile will go after the target that it was designed for. But it's to be a little bit more autonomous, meaning that it's going to think and strategize for itself. What could possibly go wrong with that, right? Uh, so that, that's what's going. And then, of course, remember last year, this year, early this year, the Chinese were talking about sending you know tons of troops a few thousand troops to Syria. Well, we don't know if they're there or not, because it's like, it's the same thing, even Japan talked about doing that, and all of a sudden they say they're going to do it, and all of a sudden uh, they get lost or something, and you never they never seem to arrive. But there is speculation that they are there, but now they're going to be uh, bringing in humanitarian aid, which I think they've already started. Uh, so that means there's Chinese troops on the ground, and I can guarantee you if the Chinese are bringing in humanitarian aid, they're bringing in weaponry as well, the same way everybody else is. I mean, if the CIA is doing it, the Mossad is doing it. Um, the, the, the Chinese, would. why would they do it? Well, they could be bringing in weapons for two things, if they are bringing in weapons. Uh, number one, they could be bringing in weapons uh, uh, to uh, you know, give the Syrian Arab army a little bit more of an advantage over the ISIS. Uh, and, of course, they're go along with this uh, military, uh, the aid... The other thing, too, that would happen if they actually are bringing in, let's say they're, they're just being completely genuous and bringing in just, you know, like real humanitarian aid, food, blankets, medicine, etc., etc. If they're doing that, um, Aleppo is the city that once Aleppo was taken by the government, then the, pretty much it's over for the jihadis. This is why Assad said that within the next couple of months, they're probably going to, to win, win the war in Syria. And at that point, all the jihadis are going to have to flood probably into Germany. Apparently there's already like 43,000 uh, suspected jihadis in, in Germany. God help them. Uh, but at Merkel, like, oh, no, no, that's, you know, not that many. You know, it's like, yeah, it's probably that many. Um, so if they bring in this humanitarian aid, obviously they can help the Syrian government win over the people a little more, get more support. The more support they get from the people, uh, the, the better it is. Uh, you know, the quicker they, you know, the quicker the people out these jihadis and what have you. 
So that, but the idea that the Chinese military will be training up the Syrians, I mean, you think about the Syrians, I mean, they, they did get a bit of an advantage when they got training from the Iranians. They're getting advantage being trained and, and helped by the Russians. For, you know, if it wasn't for the Russians, Syria would have fell about two years ago, uh, or about a year ago, I guess, or I guess it'd be almost a year and a half that Russia's been in there. Whatever, whatever is the timeline, Russia's been in there. I mean, they came in in the 11th hour, you know, just before Syria was about to fall by the jihadis. In comes Russia with their air power, you know, SWAT and flies, uh, giving a bit of training, uh, but not too much. Now, also, the Chinese, the benefit they get from training up the Syrians is they can observe, uh, you know, combat conditions. And again, this is kind of like a precursor to war, too, in the sense that they, they, they're they using, tra like the Russians, I, I've said several times, some people agree, some people disagree, but the Russians are using Syria like, a you know, the best live fire training exercise they've ever had. You know, they get to see if their aircrafts work under certain conditions. They get to test all their new equipment. They get to test their missiles. They get to test, you know, launching missiles and missile strikes from the Black Sea, that type of thing. Will they hit targets, whatever. Uh, they get to test all this stuff. So this war is actually a benefit to Russia. So if it's benefiting Russia, well, China's probably looking at this saying, well, our, you know, our guys, they got lots of training, but they don't have real-world experience. Maybe we can get a few of them in there, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing, as observers or whatever. Uh, you know, put them on the front line so they get that combat experience. Uh, because you can train and you can train and you can train, but you don't know how your tactics are going to work until they're used in combat experience. So they could, you know, just say, okay, well, we'll train the Syrian guys with our combat training and see if these, these tactics work. And if they work, well, then we know to keep training that. But if there's, like, major flaws in the, in the uh, training, uh, you know, war will expose that. Uh, that type of thing. So that, that, that's, that's kind of what they're doing. And also, uh, the Chinese are still talking about a planned mission to the moon. So we could have a hammer and sickle moon, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, the red moon. Yeah, the red moon landing. That, that's, that's, uh, the Chinese are really getting, you know, they really are advancing in a lot of areas. I mean, they still have, you know, a lot of problems. And they're still, you know, in some stuff they're behind in technology. But in a lot of stuff they're very, very, they're advancing. They, the, the, the point is they're advancing. Their navy's advancing. Their military's advancing. Uh, they're definitely at high tensions between Japan and, and China. Um, that type of thing. So it really does, you know, you can't see the direction they're taking. The direction they're taking is to prepare for war. They know the United States wants them to strike first. Uh, but they might... You know, if they prepare enough, they might be, be able to put themselves into a position uh, within the next few years to be so much more advanced than the United States that they can strike first. And God help us if they can. Uh, because right now, if it was a one-on-one -on -one between the United States and China, I'd say the United States would win, but at what cost, I don't know. Remember, they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of people to pick from. You know, they, they, they've got you know, a third of the world's population there. So that's a lot of fighting men and women that they can, they can muster up in a draft if they need to. Uh, how big is the Chinese military? It's hard to say because it depends how you add them up. If you're just going regular forces, they're like four million man army or whatever. Uh, Russia has went from a million man army to a four million man army uh, in only since 2010. That, that, that's a ridiculous amount of expansion in the military. You know what I mean? Uh, but with the Chinese... There's security forces, there's special jungle forces, they got all these special forces that when you add them all up, they could have 200 million man army. Uh, plus, if you add up veterans and stuff like that, and then the capability of the draft, they could have a 700 million man army. That would make it almost impossible to uh, invade China, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's the thing, you know, if, if they actually arm their populace, it'd be uh, pretty much virtually impossible to do that. That said, their defense systems, how good are they? Well, we don't know until they actually start shooting down airplanes, right? So I think they, their defense systems will be good enough that they will shoot down particularly older older airplanes that are not quite fully upgraded, uh, you know, NATO airplanes and stuff like that. I do think they'd probably, you know, they might not win the war, but they're going to, you know, it's going to be at a great cost. Uh, probably beyond that of World War II. It won't be like Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you know, which, uh, look at, a, at Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, you're talking a few thousand U.S. soldiers fighting ragtag army. That's fighting a ragtag army for a couple of years. Okay, that's not fighting China. China, you know, I'm not overestimating their capabilities. I'm just saying their numbers do, you know, uh, quantity is a quality. And there's some people, they have this idea that, you know, it's the same type of people that believe that World War I was going to be done in like uh, three weeks, that type of thing, two weeks, three weeks, or a month, four years later. Uh, they believed World War II was going to be 
six months tops. You know, they were going to, you know, ride into Berlin and, you know, take out the, the SS and, you know, in six months. And, the, and look, look at the hell that was. Uh, millions, millions of lives. Russia lost the most people in the war, mostly civilians. 26 million people that Russia lost in the great patriotic war, so to speak. So when you look at that, they, they know that they're not going to be caught with their pants down the second time, right? Uh, my eye. Oh, hell's in my eye. Uh, but anyway, uh, that, 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 so the Chinese, obviously the Chinese, have, other than you know, some skirmishes here and there, after World War II, they, they haven't had anything big. Now, the Chinese in World War II got their asses handed to them by the Japanese. So I don't think the Chinese is ever going to make that mistake again. Uh, and that's, you know, right into the, you know, right after World War II, China was basically liberated, semi-liberated by, you know, uh, the Allied forces, you know, Britain, the United States, uh, Canada was in there, Australia was in there, and a whole host of others. Um, and they got liberated. And, but somehow they turned to communism, uh, got steered by, you know, to, to the communism, which, you know, of course, like Mao and stuff like that, you know, he went to, I think, Yale University. All, all, all these world leaders, uh, dictators, some, always have a connection to the, to, the, uh, to the Zionist plan somehow, it always seems. But anyway, uh, so China in the 1950s was a threat. It was definitely a bigger threat, uh, uh, you know, but they stayed in that 1950s technology until NAFTA came along. So basically, we built the people, we always arm the people we fight in the future. Uh, well, at least the United States does. Canada, we don't have the budget to do it, but we go along with it. That's the problem here in Canada is we always go along. Oh, we're going to go to war now because it's patriotic. Um, you know, like, uh, but I think that's starting, and as I get down into this, I think soldiers are now starting to understand that, uh, you know, you got, at some point you, you, you can't follow, just follow orders anymore. You're going to get everybody killed. Uh, the Chinese, I think if we were to fight them today, it would be an eight-year war. That, that's my honest opinion. It would be an eight-year war to take out the Chinese today. Uh, why? Just because if it's that hard to take out a bunch of jihadists, uh, you know, I, and I mean even if it was like an actual official war, not a war on terror, but an actual country-by-country country war, um, and weapons free, if it moves, kill it, it would probably take eight years to defeat China. Uh, just because of the manpower, the strategy, the, the logistics problems, uh, the Chinese, they will take Guam. There's, you know, that, that's probably the first air play base they're going to hit. And yes, the, the U.S. has brought all three bombers to Guam, types of bombers. They got B-52s, uh, B-2s, and B-1 Lancers there, so they got the stealth there. And they're, they're there mainly as shows of force. But Guam isn't a very big island. Uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, they only have to, they can, they can take out the, mis the, the base with cruise missiles, basically. You know, and hammer that for a week straight. Uh, you know, and once Guam is taken, I mean, it'll be like, Guam will be the new Guadalcanal. Like, it, it will be just a, just, just a bloodbath. Um, it'll be mostly air power and stuff like that. But the navies, the problem is, is in order to defend Guam, uh, you know, the, the Chinese have the advantage there because they can get their missiles within range of Guam. That, that's the thing. Well, not all their missiles, but a handful of them. And they can get their navy closer to their home ports uh, and close to, but yeah, close enough to Guam. So it, it, it's an advantage to them uh, to take Guam. If they take Guam, they take the the, the, the South Pacific. Um, pretty well, maybe not completely, but again, how big of a struggle that would be. Uh, their plan in a war scenario, the Chinese have said they would go right and up to invading uh, Australia. So think about that. They would go through the Philippines, which if you haven't heard the Philippine uh, president, this guy, I don't know if he's running for president or if he is a president. I think he is the president now. This guy's basically pulled a page out of Donald Trump's book, and he's been trash-talking the hell out of, out of, like, John Kerry. And stuff. The guy's hilarious. To, but he basically, you know, he, he seems to be a bit of a truther. I like this guy. He's like, he's, he's a complete rebel rouser. Uh, I, I can't remember what his name is, but he's the, he's either, I think he's the president of, of, of Philippines right now. He's, you gotta listen to this guy. He was on RT the other day, just like chewing John Kerry a new one. It was like, it was, it was good. like not face to face, but you know, he, there was a lot of truth in what he was saying. Very, he was very brackish. And then he copped up to, well, I was hungry and a little bit grumpy. That's why I said what I said, but you know, whatever. Uh, but also, with the tensions going on there and missile systems going, you know, the Thrad missile systems going all over the place, all over, you know, there's a lot of people that are protesting the United States in the, in the South Pacific that don't want to be a, uh, Malaysia, they're trying to play peace, you know, like, you know, they really don't want to get caught up in a war between 
Japan and China and the United States and NATO and stuff. I, they really don't want to be caught up in that. And I don't blame them because, I mean, they're, they're little islands and stuff like that. I mean, Malaysia is big enough, don't get me wrong. But, uh, you know, it, they don't have a lot of infrastructure to begin with. It wouldn't take much for the Chinese to really, uh, you know, do a lot of damage there. Taiwan, the same thing. Like, Taiwan, how will Taiwan fare against the Chinese? Well, the Chinese... One thing about their uh, armor is that they have a lot of amphibious ve amphibious vehicles, uh, specifically with the intention of taking Taiwan. So that said, they're really set up perfectly for an island hopping war. Uh, they probably won't take those islands first, uh, but they'll take the islands around them, and then again, nothing gets through. Uh, so Taiwan, I mean, what can it really manufacture by itself? Uh, the Taiwanese pilots, uh, I don't know if they're still flying the Mirages or whatever. They're good pilots, stuff like that. Uh, they, they've got the missile systems and stuff like that. But you have to understand, like the Chinese, the way they're going to fight, they have kind of like a two-pronged approach that they're probably most likely going to do. Obviously, they're going to use, it's going to be a cruise missile fest. They'll try to take out the, uh, do one or two things. Either, and they might use, <laughs> because they can do this, they could probably, you know, buy, get a whole bunch of old MiG-21s from Russia fly them towards uh, Taiwan. Okay, each one gets shot down, but by the time they shot down the 115th, uh, uh, you know, uh, MiG-21, the Chinese don't care about losing people. It's like, it's, you know, it's like the Japanese sending in kamikazes in World War II. They, they, they'll, just, they'll just make it a patriotic thing. Uh, but the idea is that the 116th aircraft that comes in, that's when they send in their good stuff, because at that point, all the air defense system is either destroyed or burnt up trying to shoot down you know, either cruise missiles coming in or these lower budget first wave kind of 1950s kind of technology, you know, burn up your guys on that. Like that's the cannon fodder. So, uh, and save the elite forces for the, the, the actual invasion. So that's what they would do there, but they have to do it in such a way that they can go after Taiwan, Vietnam, um, uh, and, uh, which call it South Korea, kind of all at the same time. They can hold off on the Philippines for a bit. They can hold off on Malaysia. And they can hold off on Australia for a bit because they can't do it all at once. But they can work. They're going to work their way down in an island hopping war. It's, it's pretty much the indications that I, I'm, I mean, where they're setting. That's why they're making up these man-made islands so that they, you know, anything flies by it, anything tries to sail by it, they can blow it out of the water, blow it out of the sky, and even if they lose the island, they don't really lose much. They lose a bit of a strategic advantage. That's it. But the thing is, is to take those islands, okay, uh, from China will cost whoever's trying to take those islands more. Th that's the thing. So mainland China obviously is not going to be invaded anytime soon. But if they, they spread their military and their navy out, give themselves safe passage through all these little islands that they're arming up with missiles and stuff like that. I mean, the Chinese are, you know, they're, they're, they, know the, they, it's, they know the region. They know, they know probably better how to strategize how to, how to win the war there. And I don't think they, they're going to go at it uh, in a short-term kind of conflict. I think they would do a, more of a kind of tit-for-tat bleed-out. Uh, shoot a ship one day, uh, we blow up uh, three airliners the next day. That type of thing. That's what they would do. Um, the main invasion, I don't think, would come right away. It would be... Uh, in some areas, yeah. Like, I mean, they'd probably want to take Taiwan as quickly as possible. Um... If they could take Taiwan, which it would be a bloodbath for the Chinese. So obviously for Taiwan, they're not going to use their good troops on Taiwan right away. Uh, they're going to wear down Taiwan. South Korea, I think what they would do with that is just start arming the North Koreans a little bit better. Let North Korea deal with South Korea the most uh, because that's the main conflict right there. And then when it comes to Japan, Japan, I think they would fight an extremely defensive war against Japan until they could wear the Japanese down. Uh, so that's why I, would, I think the war would take so long. Uh, against NATO in the United States, uh, that type of thing. Again, Guam would probably be the first island they would hit. And then once they can kind of control the region, that's when they make the push to Hawaii. Um, they would make a naval push to Hawaii. People say, no, they never do it. But they would. They would. They, they're, 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 they will be on islands that we won't even suspect. Uh, we'd also, uh, the other thing is the South American connections, that the Chinese will be basically staging all kinds of stuff in South America, including missile systems, if they're not there already. I know that the, the, there's a good chance that the Russians already have Topol M's in Cuba and places like that. That's why Obama, again, you know, did this lifting the sanctions of, of Cuba, is because Russia is starting to build their base up there. And, the, you know, it's, and it was also, I think, in Nicaragua as well, where the Russians just recently opened up another radar station. So 
you know, things are moving. They, they are moving and stuff like that. Uh, now, Turkey, um, I think that's all i got to say about China for now, but Turkey's basically got, uh, you know, did an artillery barrage into Syria, a good-sized artillery barrage. And artillery barrages are going to be kind of the, the uh, theme of this uh, uh, video. But Turkey, it looks like, and if you look on it on the map, I'm going to have to do a, a global view uh, World War Three update pretty soon, just to kind of, I'll, I'll do it maybe in, in the fall when, you know, we get near the year's end, so we can kind of recap of everything that's kind of been going on and what's kind of happened throughout the year. But when you see it on a map, that's when you understand that we are at war. Uh, yes, it's still a Cold War, but we're at war. But I, as I suspected, Turkey jumped side, and it does look like very clearly that they are on the side of the Russians. They're not fully there yet. I don't know exactly all what they're going to do, but when you look at it, the Russians are now, you know, going to be lightly working with the Turks. Uh, you know, the Turks are, like, being Russia-friendly. The biggest indicator of this was the last update where they pulled all those nukes from Turkey and they're bringing them to uh, uh, Romania. I, I said Georgia, sorry about that, it was Romania. And they're, like, basically, the, the U.S. wouldn't be moving these things unless they thought they were going to lose control of them. So that tells you what's going on there. But the idea is that you have Turkey now going around, and then you've got China on the other side. Uh, they're boxing in. At some point, Saudi Arabia is going to have to capitulate for, self, for survival, or else it's going to be wiped out by the Houthis. And the Houthis are still kicking the crap out of the, the, the Saudis, right? So China is invested in Saudi Arabia, so I think what they're probably doing is squeezing the, the Saudis to switch over. And if they do that, then basically Syria... Uh, is lost uh, to, to the Anglo-American Empire. And that said, with the Russians using the air base in Iran, which, uh, to do bomb strikes, the thing is, is the Iranians invited them in. They, they said they're going to hold off for a little bit uh, because the Iranian government said something stupid the other day and then, you know, kind of insulted the Russians a bit. So the Russians said, okay, well, then we're not going to help you then. <laughs> that type of thing. Uh, but that said, again, why would anybody be complaining about a country hosting another country to use their air bases? You know, if it's, it's, you know, to fight terrorism, right? Um, exactly, you know, it, it's, it exposes itself for what it is. So, that said, uh, the bombing runs coming from uh, Iran into Syria by the Russians, uh, they'll probably take place again soon. Uh, so, what was that about, really? I don't know. Um, maybe it was just, okay, well, we just need the base for a couple of days because we're going to be in this region. Okay, we don't need it anymore. Maybe it's that simple. Who knows? But we know there's an alliance between Iran and uh, the, uh, Russia and China. So, And as China moves into the region, obviously China working with Iran to develop its gas, uh, gas pipelines and refineries and stuff like that, it's a big, huge deal that they have going on there. Uh, this does really make it hard. The idea of Israel striking Iran uh, you know, is, is now pretty much off the table, uh, unless the Israelis are suicidal. They got S three hundred missile systems in there. They've got, uh, you know, the Iranians are ready for war with the with Israel. So that's why I think the the rhetoric has been a little bit quieter from the Israeli side. Of uh, you know, it's not so much that they don't want to blow up Iran. Of course they do, uh, and I'm not on the side of the Iranians either. I mean, the Iranians and between the if the if the Israelis leave the Iranians alone, they don't have anything to worry about. Uh, the deal was, I think back in 2002, is they told Israel to strike Iran and the United States to take out the rest of the Middle East for them, uh, that type of thing. But they can't do it because, again, if they hit Chinese assets or Russian assets in Iran, that's very going to be very bad for Israel, even though Russia, I do believe, is on the side of Israel. Because Putin calls out everybody else, um, you know, uh, and I know I've got a lot of Putin fan Putin lovers out there, stuff like that. this is why I don't trust the guy. If He, he clearly knows, okay, if he's going to demonize the United States, fine. Uh, but he needs to he needs to point out Israel and demonize Israel as well. If you're going to say that, that you know the, the CIA is backing uh, ISIS, which they are, uh, you also have to talk about the Mossad, you, you, because the United States foreign policy is based upon what Israel wants to go to war with, right? It's the Greater Israel Project. You you can't deny it. Uh, calling a person an anti-Semite for pointing out the truth is, you know, whatever. Knock yourself out. Uh, but it is what it is. I mean, you've had. 
you know, Mossad agents admit that they created ISIS with the CIA. So it doesn't get any more smoking gun than that. Uh, the, the thing is, I think everybody kind of knows. It's just, you know, what do they do about it? But getting back to Turkey, again, the gas pipelines that the Russians and the Turks have kind of, you know, they put on hold just, you know, around the time of the, uh, the overthrow of the Ukraine, and now it's, it's back on again. These gas pipelines, again, are going to basically bypass Ukraine. So Ukraine's, uh, you, know, you know, again, East Ukraine, West Ukraine, I think I called that one pretty good. Uh, the Ukraine, yeah, is, is definitely, in, you know, they're really trying to push uh, Russia there. The Russians have, a, you know, like 40,000 troops on the border and tanks and attack helicopters and everything like that. And Crimea has basically got uh, all kinds of drills going on, you know, uh, fighter pilots and what have you. And, yeah, the Crimea is basically ready for war. Uh, the, the, the Russians are ready for war there. So there's no way that the Ukrainian government really, they don't have the manpower or the resources to really push into the, the Crimea. Uh, NATO could do it, but then that would be a you know, death sentence to the world, right? Uh, and the thing, too, is there's another problem is that Ukraine is not a part of NATO. Uh, if uh, the second Ukraine is a part of NATO, we're instantly at war because of Article 5, right? So that's not going to happen, but, you know, they, they just can't pull it off. So, I mean, if the NATO decide, okay, well, we're going to have Ukraine, well, then right there, I mean, people around the world would revolt. You say, you're going to guarantee us a nuclear war, uh, that type of thing. You know, like, no, we're not, you know, we're not doing this. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, George Soros out there, uh, the email leaks with him, you know, it exposes all this stuff. How this man is still walking free. Henry Kissinger, George Sor Soros, Z uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski, these are the, you know, I'd like to see at least those three guys go to jail, you know. Uh, or, you know, at least at least that. Uh, if they started with those guys, everybody below them will crumble, you know. And all these, uh, you know, white helmets, uh, for example, in Syria, George Soros funded. Uh, the Al Gore uh, climate change scam under the George Soros emails, George Soros funded. So for those of you who believe in the climate change, uh, global warming thing, once again, it's proven to be a scam. Uh you know, the climate always changes. That's, that's the, it's the biggest scam of all, right? Because the climate always changes. Uh, that type of thing. And the list goes on. Black Lives Matter. All that. Everything that links back to George Soros. The overthrow of the Ukraine. Yes, linked back to George Soros. I mean, this guy is a war criminal. Uh, same with Henry Kissinger. These are genocidal maniacs. And it, it, just, it just goes on and on and on. And at some point, I think, I think the, the hellhounds are going to get these guys uh, one way or another. If they don't get them through rule of law, they're going to knock them off. Uh, and I'll start, start talking about that in a moment. But, uh, yeah, so Turkey's still a wild card. Remember, Turkey is one of the largest NATO members out there, if not the largest NATO member, um, next to the United States, of course. Um, so if Turkey does get out of NATO, that changes the world dynamic big time because even India is, like, uh, out there offering, uh, you know, support to Iran and Syria, that type of thing. They're going to be developing uh, right now with Syria. The, the deals are already being made with India and China and Russia on the rebuild. They've already got those contracts. The United States will not be building in Syria, most likely, when it's stabilized. Again, if Aleppo falls to the, to the Syrian uh, government, the war is pretty much over. And at that point, that's when I think the jihadis flood into, you know, back into Saudi Arabia. They're already flooding into Europe. But at some point, they're going to start flooding into, uh, into Israel. You know, they created their own monster, right? So, you, you know, you, you reap what you sell. If you're going to arm jihadis, and, you know, again, they can't make, uh, you know, these guys are, you know, genocidal maniacs. They always have to be at war with somebody. So if they can't take the Assad government, they're definitely going to, you know, go to war with somebody. That, that somebody's going to be like Israel and Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. Again, not one ISIS attack uh, that I know of against Israel in this entire conflict. Not one. But yet... Israeli, uh, you know, Israel, you know, treats these jihadis. They call them moderate rebels when they're in the hospitals, but, you know, they're al-Nusra, they're whatever. And they keep trying to change the names. I forget what they're calling them now, but they're like the, the Syrian Democ Democratic Army or something stupid like that. It's like they're still ISIS, they're still al-Qaeda, they're still, you know, whatever. It's the same guys, you know, it's the same guys. I think people kind of figured that out by now. Uh, but there are still people that watch the mainstream media and, and, and you know, like, they haven't caught on that it, it's a proxy army for regime change. That it's not about the war on terror, whatever. It, it's, the, you know, I mean, again, you know, they drop, the U.S. drops flyers in the area they're about to bomb to warn the ISIS guys. The Russians just bomb the shit out of them. So the Russians, I think they're going after the CIA and Mossad assets, mostly. Uh, that's what I think. 
you know, like, you know, we'll hit their guys. That's why every time you hear them complaining about, oh, you're hitting our moderate rebels or poor, sweet, moderate rebels. Yeah, the ones that are, you know, all Russia has to tell, do is tell the truth. They're like, well, we're killing terrorists. <laughs> you know, you tell us where the moderate rebels are, we won't hit them. But they can't do that, you see, because then you can ex make the link between the CIA and, and uh, the Mossad and ISIS, right? That's why they can't say where the moderate rebels are, because then you can find out who's leading them and stuff like that. And I think the Russians already know. It's just they're, 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 they're like, okay, until they tell the truth, we'll just, you know, we're going to make them hurt. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on there. Um, now, that said, Julian Assange, okay, is going to leak a, another something like 15,000 emails of Hillary Clinton. And Julian WikiLeaks lawyer, uh, they said it was a suicide at first, but apparently not. Uh, they're not ruling it as a suicide got killed on a train track. I don't know what's up with that. And then there was this guy that was trying to sneak into the embassy, uh, possibly to do a hit on Julian Assange. Something I said right before the 2016 election, watch for you know people dropping dead. Uh, in Hillary Clinton's case, the amount of people that are dropping dead that either are critic, were critics of Hillary Clinton or are going to testify against Hillary Clinton in the last half month or so, uh, did they order a hit on Assange? I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking it as a question. But don't you find the timing kind of odd that somebody would try to assassinate him now? And can anybody tell me if Edward Snowden is still alive? I don't know. I mean, the, the, the rumor was he was killed. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. It's the same with uh, Prince Bandar, uh, Bandabar, or Bandar, whatever the Saudi royals are. Is he even still alive? I, I don't know. Like These people have disappeared. Where the hell are they? <laughs> you know, what happened to them? Uh, that type of thing. But Hillary Clinton uh, is definitely not looking healthy, that's for sure. Uh... The, the, there are parts of the FBI that are still going real hell-bent to try to take this woman down. You have to understand, the stress on her is not so much that they take her down, it's they take the system down. She's a lichpin. She is, she is Henry Kissinger. She is George Soros. She is Rothschild Banking and Goldman Sachs and all that. She is uh, Rockefeller Foundation. She is, you know, the Zygmunt Brzezinski's grand chessboard. She is that person. She's the one that if they take her down, they take everybody down. Uh, George Soros and all them. Um, and I think that's, again, what I refer to as the hellhounds, call them spooks for the conscience. It looks like they are at least trying to uphold a last-ditch attempt at upholding rule of law. But you have to understand, there's the fighting is within the faction. I remember a few years ago, um, Obama's, uh, you know, put out a, a memo on the, the White House saying that there was fighting amongst the faction and the problem was being rectified. Uh, and they were talking about the CIA and the intelligence groups and stuff like that. And I can imagine there's a lot of good patriots in there that want to take their country back, that they realize how criminal these people are. But the thing is, is you have to understand, the system is rigged in favor of these, these criminals. You know, they obviously set it up very well. So it's not going to be easy to take these people out. But by keep exposing it, I mean, again, name me a politician that for, let alone the last past couple of weeks, for years on end has had uh, the FBI or here in Canada, CSIS or whatever, going after them. You know, almost day in and day out. Uh, this is a, this is a historical first. This woman is semi untouchable, but I don't. I think that's coming to an end. And if rule of law doesn't work, what I call the hellhounds, called spooks for the conscience, vigilantes, whatever patriots, if they don't get her, uh, then the alternative is a, is a military coup. And, and some of the news I got here will, will kind of kind of show you the the early butterfly effects of a military coup coming. Um, so Hillary Clinton will have to watch that. Donald Trump, uh, apparently he's gaining the black vote. Because I think a lot of the African Americans can see through the, you know, this uh, Black Lives Matter stuff. And, and, and you hear from a lot of blacks, too, the, talking about how stupid they are. And, you know, they, they understand. They might not know who George Soros is. But once you start making the George Soros connections, again, an extreme criminal. Uh, his sons probably know better. Um, that type of thing, uh, but anyway, yeah, like they're they're seeing that you know they can't vote. You know the Demo uh, even Donald Trump has said it. The Democrats have taken your vote for granted. They 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 basically, you know, don't give you anything. And one of the Trump's things Trump said, you know, he says, you know, sometimes I say things that are harsh or whatever, and and I you know I regret doing that, but we live in tough times and things need to be said. And he goes, one thing he says, I might say something bad, I might say something, bad, but I'll never lie to you. Now. If he, I think Donald Trump is semi-genuous about that. 
How does he flip-flop on some stuff? Yes, the man doesn't work off the script. So when he flip-flops on his stances from time to time, and of course the mainstream media try to make a big thing out of it, I'm like, well, I'm not really that surprised because he doesn't work off a script. You know, and again, we could see here in Canada, uh, you know, like Trudeau works off a script. Uh, all his, his uh, newly appointed uh, gender equality uh, uh, MPs and stuff like that, they all work off a script. You ask them something, they just give you this you know, circle jerk of a, of a regurgitated line, uh, a company line, you know, like there, there's no genuineness to them whatsoever. And a lot of people, when you just catch it for the first time, you don't catch it. But after a while you start, didn't he just say that last week? <laughs> it's the same rhetoric all the time, you know what I mean? That type of thing. Well, with Donald Trump, it's right off the cuff. There's no speed, there's no teleprompter in front of this guy. He's going to say things. He's going to contradict himself. He, you know, he's going to slip on words. Yeah, of course, you know, of course. And there's some people that, that, that that's why they don't trust him, whatever. Again, I don't know if he's rigged or not, because if he's rigged uh, for the system, then uh, they would have had to dial him back at some point to give Hillary Clinton a huge lead, but she's not in a lead. Uh, on the mainstream media, the polls they're showing shows her in a lead, but she can't even feel her conven fill her conventions. Uh, she has to hire people to... I don't think anybody's buying the Hillary Clinton scandal. So when she wins the election, then it's game on for a war. But I think... One thing that was shown in, in the, in the uh, George Soros emails and her emails is that the election is rigged in her favor. You know, like that type of thing. And, of course, you know, if, if it isn't obvious to you, it's because you're not paying attention. And there are people that are not paying attention that don't follow politics, and I get that. Uh, what am I doing for time? Oh, geez. Uh, anyway, I've got to move along now. Okay, South Korea, I guess about a week or so ago, it's just coming out now, scrambled uh, some jets for Chinese, uh, to, to meet some Chinese fighters. Uh, that were off the islands of Jinju, Jinju, uh, which was, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, you know, the Chinese kind of probing that area, that, that, that airspace or whatever. Again, it's all overlapping territories that they're all claiming, right? Everybody's making a claim on the Senkaku Dayu Islands. Uh, everybody's saying it's theirs. But it's not the islands that are valuable. It's the minerals, the, the, the gases, the oils. It's, it's like, it's like a, uh, you know, like, to, to simplify it, it's like, a gold mine and a palladium mine and a platinum mine and, and a, a diamond mine, a lithium mine, uh, gas oil. <laughs> like it has, like this is like a really mineral rich area. That's why everybody wants it. It's worth trillions of dollars probably. So that's why, that's what, the, that's what the stakes are. Where they could all probably, if they wanted a peaceful, it's the same thing in the Arctic there uh, between Canada, Greenland, Russia and the United States over the, you know, the, the, the Arctic shelf. Uh, for, you know, drilling in the Arctic. Really, I wish they wouldn't drill in the Arctic. That's too sense of an ecosystem, uh, sensitive of an ecosystem. We have enough oil ev everywhere. We don't, you know, we could leave it alone. Um, but if they do work on it, why not just create a big partnership? Everybody puts in their equal say, they get their equal share. You know, make life easy. You know, make life easy. Uh, fair enough, you know. Uh, the other thing, and this is kind of big news, uh, the opening morning of World War I, um, Canadians did the, the historically still standing, the largest artillery barrage in history, which was 1,050 guns opening up in the morning's early stages of World War I. That was Canada's debut into, into the, uh, the Great World War, right? And that artillery barrage still stands as the largest artillery barrage in history. Uh, you can't even imagine what 1,050 artillery guns going off would be like. That, that, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Even, even by the World War I 18-pounder technology that it probably was, the, 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 you can't imagine it. But South Korea has done their largest artillery drill. Uh, it's the biggest one they've done. 300 artillery guns. Can you imagine? 300 howitzers going off at the same time? Wow. That, that's, that's impressive. That's impressive. Now, obviously, North Korea is not very happy about that, and they did another submarine missile test uh, you know, recently as well. So the tension between North Korea and South Korea with our favorite friend, Kim Jong-un, with his pudgy fist, going to hit that big white button if you push me too far. Look at my face, it's serious. It's very serious. When I get this serious, man, things happen. Don't push me, man. Don't push me. This I Remember, I'm a very powerful leader. You know, uh, yeah, so Kim Jong-un out there, you know, he's, he's still doing his thing and making the threats that we're going to wipe South Korea off the map. We're going to take out uh, uh, the Thrad missile systems, uh, you know, in the Philippines and then, you know, whatever, and Japan or whatever. So the, the South Koreans, they're putting on their rhetoric the normal they do, but they're not going to do anything. South Korea at best will, will go to war with, uh, or North Korea at best will go to war with South Korea. 
they can't really do much. They don't have the resources to do that. South Korea is not, or North Korea is not really a threat to the world. They have a nuclear missile, sure. It is, you know, it could reach the coast of the United States, but it's going to take a week for them to set the missile up. Uh, can you say, I mean, they don't even have to bomb the missile. They just got to take out the, you know, the launch pad, just, you know, B-52 the launch pad, you know what I mean? That type of thing. So obviously, uh, you know, but the tensions are high. The tensions are high. Uh, I think before war starts out, that's, again, you, I could see China using North Korea as the useful idiot is to put the resources into South Korea. Before war starts with China, they would get North Korea to attack South Korea or something like that. And put, you know, because, I mean, that's their cannon fodder, right? Uh, that type of thing. So definitely very interesting stuff there. Now... Back to the United States. Uh, this, if this isn't coming from the Hellhounds, I don't know what is. An army brief uh, uh, was, de uh, you know, declassified, and it says that General Petraeus and Hillary Clinton are insider threats to the United States, uh, basically because of, you know, disgruntledness and irresponsibility. So. This memo that came out, this U.S. military memo, uh, it was a U.S. Army milita military memo that came out, is basically saying that uh, the fox is in the hen house. And if they're putting out a memo with that, that tells me that at some point, this is letting people know that we may have to have a military coup against, after Hillary Clinton wins the election. She's going to win the election if she doesn't die first. Uh, she's not a very healthy person. And I think the debates are coming up. Okay, like I like they may like I, I can't they're gonna they're trying to steal it from Donald Trump one way or the other. But the thing is is it's getting to the point where it's so obvious that they may actually just have to give it to Trump, which I doubt they will, because Hillary Clinton you never know, maybe because Hillary Clinton is such a wild card and they know she can't win, maybe they're trying to kill her, maybe they're poisoning her or something. You never know. Uh you know, a little bit of arsenic every Tuesday might in the coffee or something like that <laughs> might be the just the trick, right? You never know. You know, a little cesium-131 in the, in the milk, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Russian politicians get knocked. They always die of radiation poisoning, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. You never know how they're going to do it. Um, also, one last thing about North Korea, too, is uh, where they, fi they fired into uh, the Japanese, uh, the missile landed in the Japanese ID zone, uh, you know, their, their airspace, basically. Uh, it landed over their, or, or naval, naval space, whatever. Uh, so that, that creates more tension between Japan and, and North Korea as well. But uh, this last part, though, the, this memo thing, when I heard that, I was like, uh, yeah, that's definitely, definitely, I can hear the hellhounds, you know, calling right now. And again, these guys are, I think it's mostly going to be law enforcement, military, uh, because they know who the policymakers are, or, or the, the law enforcement, because they know who the policymakers are, they know who the corrupt judges are, they know who's doing what. And... That's why I think when they come out to start, you know, knocking off these politicians and stuff, and they're going to do it. I mean, it's, it's people that don't believe things like that can happen. It may not happen today. I'd say by mid two thousand seventeen, you're going to see a lot of accidents and suicides and whatever. I mean, look at look look at just in the last past couple of weeks. Like I said in early two thousand sixteen, is one of my predictions. Watch for you know politicians and everything dropping dead. Uh, there was a few politicians up here that just dropped dead. A lot of it, you know, again, these are older people. It's easy to make it look like old age, that type of thing. But there's all these people around Hillary Clinton that are just, you know, like, again, oh, they were going to testify the day after and they just happened to commit suicide the day before. Hmm, imagine, you know, who, who's that lucky? When that happens time and time again, who's that lucky? Oh, critics of Hillary Clinton. Did they actually have some really good news on her? Who knows? Uh, again, is Snowden alive? Did they try to just kill uh, Julian Assange? And it could be other people, too. You never know. I mean, the guy does have information. It, the WikiLeaks lawyer, I mean, these are people that, you know, they're, uh, even uh, Julian Assange said it. These people are doing dangerous things. You know, they're exposing really crazy psychopathic people. I don't think there's anybody any more evil and psychopathic than Hillary Clinton. And if she's senile on top of that or got dementia or whatever... Uh, who knows what, what, what's going on with this woman. Um, do you really want her in charge of, you know, the button? Like, Kim Jong-un, I think, would be a better choice for President of the United States uh, and a more stable choice than Hillary Clinton. That's how... <laughs> and think about how disastrous that would be. Uh, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. Like, I could just picture Jim, Jim, uh, yeah, Kim Jong-un <laughs> there in the White House, say... Uh, Mr. Obama, my shoes need polishing. If you don't do it, I'll nuke your own city. 
<laughs> Who do I want you to? I'm already where the want has to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I can finally conquer the world. <laughs> Kim Jong Un. Uh, you can see the North Korean propaganda lady on the on the news there. Today we are in the United States. Why? Because we conquered them for victory. Yeah. The North Korean weather lady. She's my favorite person in the world. She is. It's, it's like one lady. She's been doing it for like decades. I think she's the only North Korean weather lady. But it's like today the sun will shine on North Korea. For victory! You know, like, it's, it's so intense, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. The rain, the rain, the, the rain or tears of our fallen comrades! For victory! You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I laugh, I cry, what do you do? Uh, but anyway, with that, um, clearly, again, you see the FBI out there. These are the hellhounds that I'm talking about. They are trying to make a go of it. These are the guys that are doing it in the open. But the ones that are really going to be the, again, what's going to happen to all these FBI agents, CIA agents that went along with the program? This is why Hillary Clinton is such a linchpin of the system. If they take her down, they take down, uh, uh, who's a, is it Brenner? Not Brenner, uh, the guy, the head of the CIA, all, and, and the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and all that. They take that all down, the Saudi royals. They take down the, uh, you know, maybe not there, but, you know, the connection, the, the Israel. They're, they're going to take down everything. APAC, uh, New American Century, Henry Kissinger's, uh, you know, the State Department. They're going to take down an awful lot if, by taking out Hillary Clinton. Now, the thing is, is 15,000, yeah, man, this lady must spend all day on freaking emails, I swear to God. Uh, but they're, they're, there's, clearly they're trying to take her out. The question is, is these hell handles, when they do show up, and they start knocking off politicians and stuff, and I'm not making any threats, I'm like, if you can't see it coming, like, I mean, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of things I call right, I just don't know the date and time, that's the only thing, I'm like, okay, the butterfly flapped its wings, you know, the hurricane is going to be over there somewhere, I just don't know what day it's going to get there. Uh, that type of thing. And I think there's a lot of, you know, again, if you are law enforcement, military, listening to this, you have access to resources. You know, put, if you get, if you want to save the world, George Soros, Zygmunt Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, start with those guys, take them down. Clintons, Bushes, Obamas, Blairs, etc., etc. If you don't take these people down, we do go to war with Russia and China. If Hillary Clinton wins, um, Russia said it as well, Hillary Clinton is a bigger threat to world peace than any nuclear weapon could ever be. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, maybe not exactly, you know, but that's her, you know, they're like, she will get us into war. It's pretty much Putin's words. Uh, that type of thing. And really, the Russians, yeah, okay, the Russian people have to deal with their corruption on their end of the things. That's up to them. They have dog in, the, their dog in the fight over there. Our dog in the fight here is that the American election will affect us Canadians. <laughs> you know, that's why I cover a lot of this stuff, too. I got, you know, I got to wake up, my, wake up my fellow Canadians as well. Um, the Trudeau maniacs, I mean, the the you know, these people don't question government whatsoever. They love big government. They're, they're you know, they're those type of people, right? You can't, you can't even save them from themselves. But the rest of them that are, I mean, most Canadians don't pay attention to politics at all. That's the problem. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to find out in the 11th hour why we're going to war. You want to know ahead of time why we're at a Cold War now and why it's, they're trying to get Russia and China to fire first. Uh, even North Korea knows not to fire first. You know, you know what I mean? Like, that's the thing. Think about uh, Assad, okay, how much discipline he's had to put into his, his troops to not fire back at Israel when Israel fires and artilleries, and apparently they just did another, Israel fired artillery into Syria again. Again, every time the Israelis attack, you know, the, uh, in, in, in Syria, they're never attacking ISIS, they're always attacking Assad's troops. The United States basically telling, you know, Assad that, you know, you can't, your guys don't let them fly around here and there. Okay, you're telling the Syrian people and the Syrian army they cannot fly around in their own country, uh, or a Syrian air force they can't fly around in their own country, uh, that type of thing. You know, basically, yeah, it, it'd be like the Russians flying over the United States saying, you know, we're going to fly here, don't you guys be here when we're here. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, really? You know, like, can you not see the hypocrisy in that? Uh, but I, I, I get I, most of the Americans are, I think, are waking up to the point that their government is really evil. Like, I mean, beyond evil, death and debt-based economy. I, I've said it before. Max Kaiser coined it. I, I think he was dead on on that. And I think that's it's just a question of more people are awake than people think. It's just what do we do about it? You know, and I think this is where the hellhounds come in. They they have to step up to the plate. They have to restore rule of law. And if they don't, we go to war, and it will be a thermal nuclear war. So if you love your children, you know, do you love your paycheck more than your children? That's the question you have to ask to the law enforcement. You love your paycheck more than your children. If you love your paycheck more, then just keep doing what you're doing. Go along to get along. If you love your children more and love your country more, then you have to possibly even at the martyring of your own job, 
or even possibly your own life, you have to save your country. That's your patriotic duty, is you have to put these world elites in jail. Uh, they have construed the law to be in their favor to break the law. Henry Kissinger said it best. Illegally, we do right away. Unconstitutional takes a little bit longer. Guys like that need to go to jail. And the reason why they need to go to jail is so that the, even if it's still a bit of an illusion, people see rule of law. Because when rule of law is gone, the amount of death and destruction that will follow that that's why it's so important. That's why, yeah, you know, the idea, you know, kill them all, you know, whatever. Once they get into that kind of a hellhound kind of cleansing where they just start knocking people off, then you go into deeper uh, uh, destruction and deeper um, destabilization and deeper, uh, you know, corruption. And from there, like, again, the new boss might be worse than the old boss. We don't know who these hellhounds are. Who are they trying to, you know, if they overthrow Hillary Clinton, what's the new boss going to be like? You know what I mean? And that type of thing. So we have to watch with that. As we get closer to the election, watch for bodies dropping dead. I can imagine these memos being sent out are being sent out to prominent people for the Plan B. The Plan B, I do believe, is a military coup after Hillary Clinton wins the election. Because uh, at this point, she can only win by stealing the election. There's just not enough. I mean, the demographic that was supposed to be a given uh, to vote for is now switching to Donald Trump. So, Yeah. I think I think I think the system has pretty much exposed itself, and you know we're in a in an interesting times to say the least. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. There's always more. I'm sure I'm forgetting stuff, but uh, next that uh, links down. If you like this kind of content, please consider making a donation channel. Links down below. Thank you so much to everybody who has. Next to that, uh, the TSU link. It's still down below. It'll be down below probably for about the till the end of the month, and then I'll get rid of it if they they don't bring the site back up. They might. You never know. Uh, but if they do, you can make a couple of bucks there for yourself. If you have other, know of other sites that are, you can make residual income on, uh, link it down below. Uh, Rising tide floats all boats in these tough times. Uh, so there's that. Rate, subscribe, share, comment, like. Be true to yourselves. Be true to others. Always, always do the right thing and have yourselves a great day. Good day. Hi and welcome. Uh, quick video here. <laughs> Kidding. I never do a quick video. Uh, somebody called me on that one the other day when I did my flash video. It ended up an hour long. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to go that long, but yeah, you got me. Uh, got notes again. Yeah, imagine that, getting more professional. Yeah, now I got a piece of paper. Last one was just a napkin I wrote on. This one was an actual piece of paper folded up different ways. But anyway, World War Three update. Uh, uh, where do I ch uh, chime in on this one? Um, there's going to be a lot about China, so I guess I'll just kind of go through it like this. Uh, yes, so China. Now, the world is kind of, we know the world's a crazy place. It's always been a crazy place. And now, but now we're a crazy place in the nuclear age. Uh, we know Russia only has like two other uh, official bases outside of Russia. But China is now starting to expand. Uh, they're going to be putting a base in Africa, a military base in Africa, Central Africa. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's significant. I forget exactly which country they're putting it in. But I can see why they're doing it. I mean, the Chinese have been working, you know, with African countries like in Nigeria and places like that. Uh, and everywhere they go to build partnerships and, and for resources and stuff like that, then they, you know, terrorism follows. So Boko Haram, again, like ISIS, Boko Haram, I don't talk about them very much, but they are pretty much, it looks like they're backed by the CIA as well. Almost all these jihadi groups are. And that's because it's against China. Same with South America. Uh, with the, uh, we have the Panama Canal, which the Chinese kind of own it, but really it is Rothschild owned. Uh, so they're going to be building in Nicaragua, they're going to be building their own canal. I that don't know when it'll be done, but that'll bypass the Rothschild Canal. Uh, so in other words, competition. So that, I think when that's done, then you're going to see some real uh, hardship against the uh, petrodollar. So the Chinese building a base outside of China is, is out of that, that is out of the normal. That is not something that they normally do. Um, so the last thing we need is China with expanding, uh, you know, to, to, to get into that expansionism kind of mentality. Uh, because that, that guarantees a war for sure. Uh, so that, that, that's something uh, that they're doing. And on top of that, they've got this new missile that they're, it's a cruise missile, I guess. Uh, it's supposed to have basically autonomous uh, decision making. It's a fire and forget missile, basically, they could fire it off, they could go to another target, that missile will go after the target that it was designed for, but it's to be a little bit more autonomous, meaning that it's going to think and strategize for itself. What could possibly go wrong with that, right? Uh, so that, that's what's going, and then of course, remember last year, this year, early this year, the Chinese were talking about sending, you know, tons of troops, a few thousand troops to Syria? 
Well, we don't know if they're there or not, because it's like it's the same thing. Even Japan talked about doing that, and all of a sudden they say they're going to do it, and all of a sudden uh, they get lost or something, and you never they never seem to arrive. But there is speculation that they are there. But now they're going to be uh, bringing in humanitarian aid, which I think they've already started. Uh, so that means there's Chinese troops on the ground. And I can guarantee you if the Chinese are bringing in humanitarian aid, they're bringing in weaponry as well, the same way everybody else is. I mean, if the CIA is doing it, the Mossad's doing it. Um, the, the, the Chinese, would why would they do it? Well, they could be bringing in weapons for two things, if they are bringing in weapons. Uh, number one, they could be bringing in weapons of... Uh, uh, to, uh, you know, give the Syrian Arab army a little bit more of an advantage over the ISIS. Uh, and, of course, they're going, along with this uh, military, uh, the aid, the other thing, too, that would happen if they actually are bringing in, let's say they're, they're just being completely genuous and bringing in just, you know, like real humanitarian aid, food, blankets, medicine, etc., etc. If they're doing that, um, Aleppo is the city... That once Aleppo was taken by the government, then the, pretty much it's over for the jihadis. This is why Assad said that within the next couple of months, they're probably going to, to win, win the war in Syria. Now, at that point, all the jihadis are going to have to flood probably into Germany. Apparently, there's already like 43,000 uh, suspected jihadis in, in Germany. God help them. Uh, but at Merkel, like, oh, no, no, there's you know, not that many. You know, it's like, yeah, it's probably that many. Um, so if they bring in this humanitarian aid, obviously they can help the Syrian government win over the people a little more, get more support. The more support they get from the people, uh, the, the better it is. Uh, you know, the quicker they, you know, the quicker the people will out these jihadis and what have you. So that, but the idea that the Chinese military will be training up the Syrians, I mean, you think about the Syrians, I mean, they, they did get a bit of an advantage when they got training from the Iranians. They're getting advantage being trained and, and helped by the Russians. For, you know, if it wasn't for the Russians, Syria would have fell about two years ago. Uh, or about a year ago, I guess. Or I guess it'd be almost a year and a half that Russia's been in there. Whatever, whatever is the timeline, Russia's been in there. I mean, they came in in the 11th hour, you know, just before Syria was about to fall by the jihadis. In comes Russia with their air power, you know, SWAT and flies, uh, giving a bit of training, uh, but not too much. Now, also, the Chinese, the benefit they get from training up the Syrians is they can observe, uh, you know, combat conditions. And again, this is kind of like a precursor to war, too, in the sense that they, they, they're they using, tra like the Russians, I, I've said several times, some people agree, some people disagree, but the Russians are using Syria like, a you know, the best live fire training exercise they've ever had. You know, they get to see if their aircrafts work under certain conditions. They get to test all their new equipment. They get to test their missiles. They get to test, you know, launching missiles and missile strikes from the Black Sea, that type of thing. Will they hit targets, whatever. Uh, they get to test all this stuff. So this war is actually a benefit to Russia. So if it's benefiting Russia, well, China's probably looking at this saying, well, our, you know, our guys, they got lots of training, but they don't have real-world experience. Maybe we can get a few of them in there, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing, as observers or whatever. Uh, you know, put them on the front line so they get that combat experience. Uh, because you can train and you can train and you can train, but you don't know how your tactics are going to work until they're used in combat experience. So they could, you know, just say, okay, well, we'll train the Syrian guys with our combat training and see if these, these tactics work. And if they work, well, then we know to keep training that. But if there's, like, major flaws in the, in the uh, training, uh, you know, war will expose that. Uh, that type of thing. So that, that, that's, that's kind of what they're doing. And also, uh, the Chinese are still talking about a planned mission to the moon. So we could have a hammer and sickle moon, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, the red moon. Yeah, the red moon landing. That, that's, that's, uh, the Chinese are really getting, you know, they really are advancing in a lot of areas. I mean, they still have, you know, a lot of problems. And they're still, you know, in some stuff they're behind in technology. But in a lot of stuff they're very, very, they're advancing. They, the, the point is they're advancing. Their navy's advancing. Their military's advancing. Uh, they're definitely at high tensions between Japan and, and China. Um, that type of thing. So it really does, you know, you can see the direction they're taking. The direction they're taking is to prepare for war. They know the United States wants them to strike first. Uh, but they might... You know, if they prepare enough, they might be, be able to put themselves into a position uh, within the next few years to be so much more advanced than the United States that 